How's it going, everybody? My name is Ron Sparkman, and I'm the Chief Curiosity Correspondent for the Space Foundation Discovery Center. And we have another incredible guest for you today. But before we get started, we want to remind you that we recently announced the launch of our Center for Innovation and Education. The Center for Innovation and Education, I cannot speak today, creates and delivers inclusive, innovative, and sustainable workforce development and economic opportunity programs that enable all people to actively participate in the space economy. Through public and private partnerships, the center engages students, young leaders, entrepreneurs, and professionals. We encourage you to learn more about the new Center for Education, Innovation and Education, and how you can make an impact at www.spacefoundation.com backslash CINE. So as you can tell, uh, I was uh, I was kind of laughing there a little bit. John and I were, were cracking up a little bit before we started, as we have a tendency to do. So we're going to try and get through this and be as uh, be as serious as we can. But it's always fun to talk to you. Uh, we got John Conifay on the show today. Uh, the Business Development Director at Spaceflight, Inc., and also the Board of Advisors at SEDS, and uh, it does a great deal of other things. I want to dive all into that. So, uh, John, how's it going, man? How you doing? It's going well. Uh, do you want to say the name of that center five times fast real quick? Uh, yeah, Center for Innovation and Education. 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 There we that, go. Oh, see, wow. now I got it out right, but I mean, when I, when I try to read it, I can't get it correct. <laughs> that's what I, I haven't messed that up in a long time. So I mean, that's uh, no, 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 no. I was just impressed that you could do it five times fast. Wow. <laughs> well, what if people always wonder how? Like they're like, what, Ron, you speak really fast. That's yeah. how fast I can actually speak. Uh, yeah, I am. Yeah. This is me slowed down, and people always have a tendency to be like, "Wow, you can talk faster." I can are speak you, a lot faster. Are you from yeah. the East Coast? Because I get it all the time. Just because I'm I'm from DC originally. Yeah, strangely, so it was a really strange thing growing up because I'm from West Virginia, and yeah. I used to have a very thick accent. I know that I still have, you know, obviously a little bit of one, but I used to have much more of an accent than I currently do. Um, and DJing allowed me to like get away from that. So you know, I have to sound like I'm from nowhere, USA. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I have non-regional addiction. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> that was kind of the goal, but it was weird, you know, because, but, hey, man, what are y'all doing? You know, and then, but I would speak really fast with a really heavy accent, but yeah. anyway, don't want to get too far off track. So we've got John today, and John, we want to talk, you know, let's start out with, um, you know, the question I always love to ask everybody, which is, how did you find that love for uh, space and science that you currently have? Yeah. Um, so when I was a lot younger, I actually wanted to be a mad scientist when I grew up. I think grew up. I think more than anything, uh, um, astronaut or or uh, astronomer or anything like that didn't really um, uh, interest me particularly. But um, building crazy things uh, like jetpacks and and all of that would was what got me really into the technology side of things. Um, and I remember having a telescope and being pretty interested in getting a little bit into astronomy um, as kind of an offshoot of my interest in Egyptology when I was a lot younger, but it didn't really hit for me until uh, I found students for the exploration and development of space at Arizona State University. Um, I was looking for a club to, to get involved with because I went in for a Boeing internship and they were like, no leadership experience, come back when you have some. So I was like, okay, I'll go find some of that, I guess, and uh, <laughs> ended up kind of just looking around the 750 or 800 uh, different clubs that Arizona State University had. And there was this uh, this booth for students for the exploration and development of space ASU with rockets and rovers and high altitude balloon footage. And this dude, Ben Stinnett, who was the, the president there, had this really, really slick pitch. And I was like, oh, OK, these guys, these this group has their, has their stuff together. So uh, I'm going to check it out. I went to the first meeting, and they played, uh, I think it's called When We Stop Dreaming or We Stop Dreaming uh, uh, in this really dramatic fashion, turned all the lights off, and just started playing this. And I still have full goosebumps. So. Uh, uh, I was pretty much hooked from that instant. Um, I was an economics major at, at ASU, so uh, they had a treasurer opening um, the first day, and that that just kind of fell right into line with what I wanted to do. So I uh, I joined up and went uh, pretty pretty fast, pretty quickly <laughs> when it came to the club, and then joining the national board and all that. So that's what really got it for me. So, um, uh, well, I mean, that, that's an interesting thing too. And uh, you know, we like to say, you know, that space is for everybody. You were an economics major. It's not something that's most people be. Like, 
Oh, how did you get into space? What was yeah. your major in college? I'm, I was an economics major. You were what? I didn't know that until 30 seconds ago. Wow, so, yeah. like, you know, that's an interesting thing to say. Hey, listen, you know, there's there's a need for everybody in the space industry. So how did that kind of lead into you doing, you know, space full time? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, um, so I had kind of a weird past, uh, right out of high school. I was really, really involved with the music scene in DC and, uh, North Carolina, Virginia and everything. So I started a record label, um, at 18, which, which is obviously the logical choice. <laughs> um, and, uh, released a few, few albums before falling flat on my face, but I still love doing the business side of things. I was never, didn't have the practice to be a musician and things like that, but, uh, but really loved the, uh, supporting the bands, kind of the strategy behind, uh, CD release, all the logistics and things like that. Um, so after, after failing at the record label, I joined the Air Force to get some discipline and, and I really loved working on communication navigation mission systems on AWACS. Uh, and, and working on the hardcore technical aspect of that. So when I came out of the Air Force, I knew that I wanted to um, be in some type of entrepreneurship. I, having experience with a large scale organization like that, it was uh, not the most enamored <laughs> with and wanted to get back to small teams and building stuff that I'm really, really passionate about, which ended up still being technology. Um, so uh, economics was, uh, I think I read an article in the New Yorker or the economist or something along those lines about the top, um, top 50 or, uh, or top, uh, hundred CEOs all have economics degrees. So it was like, okay, cool. There's something that can, that can be widely applicable to whatever I, I decided to get into. And then it really just fell into place with, uh, the treasurer role at said ZSU opening up. Um, I got to, you know, raise, raise money, uh, at a fairly small scale there. Um, so learning those skills, like asking for, for money for students, things like that, then developed into asking, uh, uh, startups and other corporations for, for money to launch their satellites where I am right now. Um, and it, while it definitely didn't feel like a linear path, I think that was that was the impetus, and that was the uh, the connection that really set me off on the on the business development path from economics. Uh, you know, it's just an re important thing for people to remember. There are a lot of non traditional paths to get into the space industry. Mine was not one; yours wasn't. We've had more than a few people that have been on the show that haven't, and a lot of the people that we see every year don't. Um, you know, so many people think it's, you know, you have to be a scientist, you have to be an engineer. And it's a really important thing to remember uh, yeah. that you can kind of come at it from a million different angles. Artists are needed. Um, you know, designers are needed. Uh, you know, it, it, economists are needed that all these things come into play. All those pieces are part of, a, of an organ of any company. Right. So, of course, they're going to be a part of the space industry. So it's really funny. Uh, I actually while I was at ASU. And I just went full bore with the with SEDS and all of the space things. Uh, uh, ended up chairing Space Vision 2013, which is a national conference, and uh, and so academics sort of took a back seat. And economics is a pretty demanding <laughs> uh, uh, academic path. Uh, so I would walk. I had a place on the like west side of campus and I would walk through the design crowd to get to uh, to the, the WP Carey School of Business for my economics classes and all of my like the design nerds that I would hang out with uh, off hours and stuff like that and pierced and tatted that it would that I used to hang out with before the Air Force uh, with the record label was like, man, I miss this crowd so much. <laughs> and so I, uh, so I actually ended up uh, finishing my degree in this thing called design management, which was the majority of it was the economics business degrees, uh, but with uh, design theory and design thinking kind of stacked on top of it. Um, uh, so you said designers and just made me think of that. Yeah, I mean, it's a very important thing. Okay, so there, there's an interesting question that we got that just popped up here. And I always love the, the Q&As that come in because you just never know where somebody's going to come. So this is Sonny from Star, uh, based in India. He has a, a great company out there. And um, so he says, being a business developer, how do you maintain the cash flow and decide the investment for R&D? That's, that's a pretty deep question. But I mean, yeah. you're the only person I know that would probably be, uh, be able to answer that one. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, so that is... Um... 
that is a really great question and something that can be helpful in smaller companies. Business development is mostly uh, um, uh, involved with the revenue generation and then uh, some strategy for how to deploy specific products. So if you think of it from engineering to product to business development in large organizations, business development is much more on the um, uh, side of bringing in revenue, not necessarily deciding the outflows. Uh, but that being said, we do speak to customers more regularly than any other job function probably. And, uh, and we come up with new products and uh, new lines that, that would be uh, interesting to our customers. Um, Spaceflight is currently working on quite a few of those uh, uh, products. So while at my level, I'm not necessarily deciding where the R&D uh, money goes, um, using kind of case studies for specific customers, figuring out total addressable market for uh, for specific products and how it would actually benefit um, our customers if we're leaving any money on the table by not having a specific service that customers are requesting uh, leads into those decisions and those, those workflows for uh, R&D and production. Does that answer the question? I, I I think it does, but you know me, business speak is not really the thing the, the language I speak in. But I am sure that Sonny, as the CEO, completely understood everything you said. Fair <laughs> um, so you know, we we jumped ahead a little bit to kind of what you're doing now, but let, let's take a couple steps back because I want to go to uh, your time at ASU because ASU is one of the top schools in the country. If you want to do some stuff, space it really is. I mean, um, you know, I really wanted to go to ASU's uh, origin series that Lawrence Krauss was doing some years ago, and yeah. haven't had a chance to really do it. And Sonny says, "Thank you. That was uh, that was that this was so accurate." So yes, you, you were definitely helpful. Um, <laughs> um, but so uh, let, let's talk a little bit about that because you mentioned that you did some. Um, you know, you mentioned to me before that you had done some work on uh, at the labs there at ASU. So how did you really start falling into that? You know, I know the set was a big piece of it, but let's yeah. talk about that for a few. Yeah, absolutely. So um, uh, Arizona has something like sixteen NASA missions. Uh, Psyche, uh, Lucy, um, just about all of the cameras that are on Mars uh, are are at Arizona State University or the PIs are. For them are there. Um, LROC, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter Camera. Uh, Arizona State University has a really, really um, uh, long history of NASA and space missions period. So as uh, new space sort of started coming up in about 2012, uh, 2013, obviously this is another wave of the new space movement thing. Um, there were uh, professors and there was interest in getting involved in this new space uh, um, aspect. So uh, there was a professor that I was working with that was building uh, fairly novel um, uh, CubeSat designs. And um, and so I, at the time I was leading SEDS ASU, uh, we, we had had or were planning the 2013 conference where we had Bill Nye and Phil Plate uh, come speak and about 450 students from all over the uh, uh, country and internationally. And so- All of the casual name drops, like just two of the most popular science communicators in the entire country, no big deal, it was awesome. Oh, I nerded out and I, I, yeah, I still, get, uh, still get nervous thinking about it. It was, yeah. it was, it was a lot of fun and we're super happy. Yeah, uh, I refer to Neil deGrasse Tyson as Neil from time to time. They're like, "Are you in a first person basis, Ron?" Yeah. No. <laughs> I guess, I guess, I guess so. My bad. <laughs> but it's one of those things. You, it takes you time to get used to that, right? You know, yeah. you work, but you, you, uh, there's enough events that happen. You see him, and you're like, "No, I mean, you're going to call him by his full name? No, don't we call Bill Nye? Bill Nye to his? You don't mean like Bill Nye, science guy? You're like, hey, what's up, Bill? <laughs> the only thing, the only reason I think Bill Nye might remember me from that experience. Um, I don't know if I've ever told the story outside of uh, outside of it, but uh, is because we screwed up so terribly, both picking him up and uh, uh, dropping off, off. I won't go into too too far into that because I think I think there was a little bit of bad blood for that one. But uh, on the first uh, when we went to pick him up at the airport, he had just had the injury from Dancing with the Stars. Uh, we were not sure if he was even going to be able to make it because he was on Dancing with the Stars and um, and then because of the injury, he wasn't, so he was able to. Uh, so we, my 
uh, co-chair of Space Vision 2013, and I won't name him because this is an embarrassing story, but went to pick up Bill Nye. We missed him, so finally found him at baggage claim, and then we lost the car in the parking deck. Uh, so we have Bill Nye on crutches, um, kind of hobbling around while we have our, our clicker in the air trying to find the car. Uh, I think the comment was, hey, uh, Statue of Liberty, you think that's actually going to help you out very much? <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you, Everybody knows Bill from, you know, from TV. You know, that's the version that they remember, but he... And he's an ex. You know, he's the CEO of the Planetary Society now. He does a lot of stuff, and yeah. people aren't really aware of how sharp his humor can be. Oh, like, he, he really can be. Yeah, it hilarious. <laughs> he, was, he was roasting us in perfectly good humor. You know, I, it, it was hilarious and and well deserved on our part. We uh, <laughs> botched that one pretty pretty fast. <laughs> well, I mean, but that but that's something too. You you guarantee that Bill had a bad show at some point, right? You know, at yeah. some point everything went wrong on, on the science guy on PBS and I'm sure there was, you know, some some beakers broken and stuff like that, right? Yeah. You know, so yeah, that that's it. So I'm sure there's some really great bloopers from back in that time, but but anyway, so you had but this was a show you had Phil Plate, you had Bill Nye, you had a lot of really cool things going on and you had a, a bunch of people come out. So uh, yeah, let, let, we can go back and finish that story now, but that was just too funny. I mean, like yeah. oh, you know, just Bill Nye and Phil Plate. No, that, that was it. We got him. We eventually got him. Uh, got him back to the uh, uh, back to the venue, and everything you know worked out from there. He made a really, really incredible uh, talk, and uh, the students had a blast. Um, so that was that was about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I mean that, that's not the only thing. And you know, you've done so many, and I know that you had uh, you were on the board of advisors now for SGAC, but you have you had a story. I mean, sorry, with uh, with Sads, and you had a, a story time with them. I know we'll get to SGAC in a minute. Yeah. <laughs> but um, but you had a story time with them too. So let's talk a little bit about that first. What it is you mentioned a little bit earlier, um, but just for, for people that don't know, they haven't been around the organization before. What it is because it's really important to students, and we've talked about it a time or two. But in case people, this is the first time that they're watching. Uh, I want to hear a little bit about it. Can you tell us a little bit about what it is, what your work was, the, the conference that you do every year, all that yeah. fun stuff? Um, anybody that knows me is probably sick of hearing me speak about SEDS because it's a court, uh, an organization so near and dear to my heart and that I love so much. Uh, Students for the Exploration and Development of Space is the reason I am in the space industry, period. No other... Uh, it, it, it absolutely is. Um, so it was started in 1980 by Peter Diamandis uh, and, and a few other people uh, as the enthusiasm from the Apollo missions was waning. Uh, Peter and, and his, uh, his friends were just like, how can we get students and the younger generation involved and excited about space again? Um, and so we put out a call for chapters uh, for students for the exploration and development space uh, to start speaking about and getting enthusiastic with uh, about and and um, working on projects in space for for undergrads and grad students. And I think he got 101 chapters from this one article in a magazine that I can't remember the name of. I think it was called Omni. Um, 101 okay. chapters and responses. I mean, type typewritten. Uh, letters to his to his house or dorm or wherever he was at the time. So the organization's been around for uh, over thirty five years now, um, and it's uh, and it's thriving. It's probably the largest that it's ever been. I think over a hundred chapters all over the country, and uh, something like twenty new chapters um, uh, internationally. Um, they are uh, they have the goal of getting. Um, students involved with and and kind of forming a path for students into the space industry. And it, it's such a cool thing. And then every year there's the event. Actually, um, I don't know how much I'm allowed to talk about it, but I'm going to be speaking at uh, you know Space Vision this year, uh, which is really cool for me because I'm, you know, I'm I'm super excited about it. And again, can, I, the people that are going to be on the panel again, you know, I know that I'm known for vague booking. <clears throat> Sorry, <laughs> sorry, clear my throat there. <clears throat> I know that I'm known for vague booking, but we can't talk too much about it yet. But everybody else in that panel is excited. 
and I yeah. just cannot clear my throat today. Um, so <laughs> I just wanted to say, I'll talk about space vision. Don't worry about it. Go for yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like let me just tell you everything about space vision. Yeah. Um, but no, it, it really is. It's uh, it's something I've been excited about. I've heard about all these incredible talks that have happened at it. Uh, that some are known to be very moving, which I know that you were at one last year. Uh, you know, with Tanya mm-hmm. Tanya Harrison's the one that she did. That um, the way that I believe she told told me about it was that she redid it like right before and it had everybody in the room crying. And like, there's some really cool things that happen at space vision. So let's talk a little bit about it. Yeah, absolutely. So space vision, uh, if, if SEDS was the first step it took, space vision was the giant leap. Um, it, uh, it is the annual conference for students for the exploration and development of space, uh, run by and for, uh, students all over the world. Um, it, generally attracts anywhere from 200 to 500 uh, students and uh, speakers there, unlike other conferences, are there to speak to the students. It's not a get up, uh, uh, do your thing, and then get off because you're um, because you're getting paid for it. It's a, hey, we're interested in actually either recruiting or, you know, inspiring the future generations or uh, actually interacting with, you know, the, the, the future of the space industry. Um, so it's been happening since I think about 2007, since my old boss, uh, Ryan McClinko, ran it at uh, MIT. Um, and, uh, and it's been growing uh, year over year. We've had... Bill Nye, uh, Elon Musk back in the day, uh, well before SpaceX had launched. Um, <clears throat> I think Jim Bridenstine gave a special message. Peter Diamandis, uh, um, Janet Creco was the last one. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a really phenomenal opportunity for students. Uh, so I actually ended up two months after joining SEDS when I don't think I could even name the planets in order that sp- at that point in the time i was such a space like lay person um uh i was treasurer for suds for two months and then we went to space vision 2012 and uh i looked at the president and i was like we could do this we should do this we should pitch for this let's do this and the entire time i was just just bugging him and bugging him and bugging him. He was like, I just want to enjoy my time here why are you doing this uh and eventually we, we <laughs> worked like 12 hours straight on one of the days just to put in our submission, put it in that night and won, which is great. Um, large in large part because Arizona state university has such a, uh, has such a, um, yeah, great NASA background, but something of note is that a different chapter hosts it every year. So it bounces around the country. Um, and that makes it both really, really interesting, keeps everybody on their toes and, uh, and you just kind of get a different, uh, different vibe to it every year. So it's really cool. And yeah, you know, that's not and uh, that's not the only organization that you've uh, done work with that is really kind of reaching out to uh, different groups of students. One of them is SGAC, which you were the treasurer for, right? Correct for them too. Yeah. And so let's talk a little bit about that before we jump into your you know your space career. 20, 20, 25 minutes in or so, we'll finally get to the stuff you've done once you got out of school. But let's talk a little bit about SGAC because it's a group that we always love to work with, especially with New Gen, and they they're they're at, there every year at Space Symposium with us. So, but it's always a group that I like to talk about for people that may not know about it. Yeah, absolutely. So Space Generation Advisory Council, I think, uh, started about th- 30 years ago now, um, or might be about 21, but it is uh, a specifically international uh, organization for um, young professionals under 35 years of age in the space industry. Uh, it was, I think, a UN... Uh, uh, an initiative started having its roots in the United Nations. Um, so it's a pretty big deal organization um, all over the world, just in about, um, I'd wager a guess that over 80% of countries uh, have a chapter or a member. Um, and it's, its mission is to inspire and, and uh, help young professionals be successful in their space careers. Um, I came to it from... Uh, actually, a Space Foundation event, the Space Generation Fusion Forum, that is hosted every year uh, in conjunction with Space Symposium. So uh, they they have applications open up, and about 25 to 40 uh, people are young professionals are asked to join for this two to three day kind of pre Space Symposium uh, young professionals networking event. And uh, I've actually met. 
it expanded my network, even being such a small event, it expanded my network in ways that, that I couldn't even imagine it would. Uh, so I decided to get involved with uh, SGAC, met a lot of really cool people. I'd been speaking to them a bit before uh, with my role as executive director of SEDS USA. Um, uh, and eventually became treasurer and tried to put in a whole bunch of financial functions and uh, other processes to uh, to kind of help streamline how, how all of that functions. You can imagine having uh, banks in different countries as well as uh, members in different countries and all of the different financial functions of everything that you need to coordinate uh, uh, along with that can be fairly complex. I'd, I'd also wager a guess that they host over 30 different events around the world every year. So they're their own complications and very, very intense uh, financial um, international regulation and, and processes that need to go go into that. So got a lot of really good experience as treasurer uh, there for about a year, maybe year and a half. Um, and would highly suggest it as the next kind of step after uh, after SEDS. If you're a young professional under 35, go get involved. Uh, get involved with the project groups, get involved with the board, get involved with running a local event or the virtual events now. Um, it's a great way to, to kind of get your profile up, be able to speak to really awesome other young professionals and, uh, and learn. I have a very important question. Can you do oh. a dramatic glasses pull off and say processes one more time? Processes. Perfect. I just wanted to, just want to make sure that that happened because it was like you had you put such much. It's like with all the different things and processes. I'm like, oh, very important. Um, so <laughs> so um, let, let's talk a little bit about. But yeah, before we get into your career in the space industry, you got to do something cool, and that you're going to be the first person that we've talked to that's done a micro G flight, but has done it on you know a very a huge plane really outside of Loretta who we had on who was a flight director. It's gonna right. be a little different for that between that and then the actual zero G experience. So like I've done one but I do it for Project Possum. And with Possum it's it's a little different because you're you can really go and have fun on the zero G flight a little bit more than ours is a mission. You have a role to fulfill and while you get to have like that one parabola where you get to be like oh I'm gonna I want to let something float in the air. The rest of the time, you got to be very serious because you're trying to make sure that this amazing Final Frontier design space works, right? Yeah. But you guys got to have a little bit more fun with it, like it, especially if people saw the picture, that that picture that we used for the cover photo for this interview is John is like, he's having the best time ever. <laughs> yeah, he's having the best time ever. So let's talk a little bit about ZRG and how you ended up on that flight because it, yours is even a little different story than the people that just regularly would pay for the ticket. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, actually, Karina, um, our, our good friend Karina. Um, She's up, messaging me right now. Oh, nice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> brought up uh, something that I can't unsee from that picture now, but she's like, you look like you're about to, uh, like, pulling some epic wrestling move from orbit, and you're incredibly happy to just elbow drop on the It's <laughs> just like... Wow, I can't unsee that, and thanks, Green. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, so, with that microgravity flight, uh, uh, directly after Space Vision, I had this this uh, have this really great friend, Jack Lightholder, who we did all of our all of our space at Arizona State University things together, um, and he he led a lot of the projects. He was leading a proposal for the undergravity or undergraduate microgravity research program for that NASA was running uh, back in the day. And um, I was like, okay, space vision's done. I'll be involved, but I'm too wiped and I don't want to actually do much because I'm, I need to focus back on school, all this. And he was like, yeah, sure, cool, 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 cool. And then we won it. And, and I was like, Okay, cool. So got very, very involved with that. That was a big project, uh, along with running um, SEDS ASU with Jack uh, that we worked on. And it was a former experience, um, or former experiment rather, uh, that uh, PyPy, uh, who, who ran the SEDS chapter in previous years, had come up with, and I, I think was accepted, and they flew as well. But for... Um, for these six different chambers in this large experiment uh, to study uh, dust coagulation for protoplanetary disk formation. Say that five times fast. Yeah, I was gonna say, yeah, was, uh, was that English? And I am astronomy major. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, there were two different uh, models, the Deshimkazi and some other 
model on how uh, dust particulates would actually uh, start clumping together, whether it was um, essentially static or actual gravity that, that got them to clump together initially to form these larger larger pieces of space dirt that would then form protoplanetary disks and, and solar systems. Uh, so we were analyzing how these clump together in, uh, in microgravity. So we got very, very heavily involved with that. There was a team of six. I told uh, Jack not to put my name on as a flyer at all uh, because I was going to take such a backseat. Spoiler alert, I did not. <laughs> and uh, and um, uh, ended up uh, ended up going with them to NASA Johnson. Uh, the primary flyers for the first day and the primary primary flyers for the second day um, were were suiting up and getting ready to fly. I was a secondary flyer. Uh, um, playing a support role, so they were like, you know, you probably won't get to fly, uh, but if we have extra space or if everything's going well and your team's performing well, we might be able to sneak you on there. So the flight director at that point came over, and I distinctly remember him very, very, very much not liking me specifically. I think I, I, think I was older at the time, so I was a little less... Uh, like if we had to leave and go get something for the experiment, we probably didn't ask the permission that I was supposed to. And because he was dealing with so many students that were, you know, maybe uh, not paying attention to safety as much as possible. <laughs> Space suplex, nice pet. Um, uh, maybe that I gave him anxiety or something like that, but we just did not get along. But he came over and uh, the day of the flight and was like, hey guys, uh, to all the secondary flyers, and was like, hey guys, I'm really sorry to inform you um, that you're going to not uh, be able to um, drive any vehicles after you fly today because you're getting scopalmine shot. <laughs> and, you know, heart dropped and then started racing and everything because he, he got us pretty good. Um, so found out a few, like a day before, a few hours before that I, I was actually going to get uh, to fly, got this copalmine shot uh, that they give you for nausea and and everything, and had an absolute blast. Uh, we still had to run the experiment um, on while doing the parabolas, but we had I think thirty parabolas, which was incredible, about thirty seconds each, um, and uh, 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 we got spun. We had Mars gravity, so we'd do push ups, clap six times, and then go back down. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I have some pretty fun video from it, but it was it was that was the moment. Uh, even while I was doing all of the stuff with SEDS and and space, uh, it was so at the beginning of the new space movement as we know it now uh, that I still had such heavy doubts that I had a place in space and that I that I was going to be able to contribute in any meaningful meaningful way to space um, that. I hadn't decided that I was going to be all in on space, even though I was running this conference and running this chapter and, and now part of the SEDS USA board. Uh, I was like, no, it's probably not for me. Um, you know, I probably don't have a space. It's all for engineers and scientists. And then as soon as I lifted off and tapped off the wall for the first time, I was like, never mind. I need to get back here. Whatever I have to do, this is it. I'm going whole hog on this, it's, it's, uh, I'm, I'm going to work in the space industry just to get right back to this moment. It's, so, it, it's, it's, un it's, it's indescribable. You can't, it's a, it was really weird. I was super fortunate. Um, I didn't have any of the medication that makes you feel better. Right. And oh, yeah. so, <clears throat> but I was fine. And the thing was, is I wasn't even really too particular about what I was eating. I, it was the night before and I'd been there, you know, and I was in Canada. Right. And it was my first time in Canada. And I was just like, all right, I want to grab something to eat. Yeah. And, the uh, this is just, just a funny it, it just cracks me up because I ordered a pizza with like hot banana peppers something I hadn't seen in almost like twenty years my mom used to love getting those on pizza and I hadn't seen them since I left the East Coast and I'm like guess I'm getting hot banana peppers and we'll just see what happens and there's nothing you can do about the sickness oh. like even you can take stuff for it you can take every single precaution and I know plenty of people that have taken every single precaution that got sick and yeah. then here's me who's like. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that there wasn't. You know, I hadn't taken a lot of you know things up to that point. But when I took the flight, there was just 
No, and I was completely fine. You know, on the, on the, the last of our parabolas, I started getting a little, you know, it started getting me a little bit, but I was kind of surprised how well my body and my body handled it. But yeah. Uh, yeah, you just, you just don't know. You can take every single precaution and then it still gets you, or you can take none at all and be completely fine. It's just, yeah, exactly. and it, it's, that, that's what's fascinating about it. That's why we all want to you know, learn a little bit about more, more about human space flight. Once you've done it, you just realize that your body reacts in so many weird different ways that yeah. you just don't know. And, it's funny too because you forget certain things. <clears throat> you know, you're trying to push yourself. You, know, you you barely touch the wall and you move, move, yeah. move. And you're like, oh yeah, move. Yeah. yeah, and I'm big. I'm a big dude. You know, like, so it's just funny to me. It always takes effort for everything. So yeah. you know, for me to just be able to, boop, <laughs> and then you know, you're on the other side. It's it's a really crazy thing. Yeah. Um, and it, it's always uh, it's always exciting, and I'm glad you had a really cool experience with it too. And that's something I didn't even know that 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 stuff like that existed. We with Project Possum have done that stuff with zero G before, so I assume that other people have. But that's a that's a really cool story. So let's talk a little bit about your time in the space industry. You know, right at the, <laughs> right at the end here, you've you've had a you've been in it for a little while now. You've done some cool stuff. So let's talk a little bit about that first job you had in the space industry. Now you've made the decision you you want to get in it, and so you work, start working for Bryce Space and Technology. And what was it like and how was that different from, you know, the, the college work that you were doing? Because you had a lot of leadership experience coming into it. Yeah. So uh, so I guess first technical um, job was an internship with Spire uh, back in the day. Uh, um, so that was the first like three month job where I was just like, oh, my gosh, I can actually sort of do this. <laughs> um, and met a lot of really cool people still still very involved with the Spire family over there. But uh, but first job job was. Uh, uh, at NASA headquarters as a contractor for Bryce Space and Technology um, in the Office of the Chief Financial Officer, Strategic Investments Division. So again, putting, applying that economics degree, I uh, um, at Space Vision, and it all connects and goes back to at Space Vision 2013, I specifically put a panel together uh, called the Economics of Space, where one of my absolute favorite talks of all time was by Carissa Christensen, who then became my boss at Bryce Space and Technology, Carissa Bryce Christensen, to connect those dots, and uh, it was um, it was a talk about honing. She she did the the Bryce pitch and everything, and then she was like, "Okay, cameras off, cell phones off. Nobody talk about anything or or, or talk about anything that happens in this room outside of this room or what I'm about to talk about." That's um, and she was like, "Okay, this is the actual talk." And it was how to hone your BS detector uh, because it was two students. She was there to actually share her knowledge with students as opposed to just this kind of canned response. And I was sitting there and everybody that was in the room was just amazed at this talk because it was it was a phenomenal kind of intro on how to not um, how to not trip up really hardcore in the space industry. And uh, um and I was like, I want to work for for her. She's like one of the the she leads uh, the top you know analytics uh, firm for space technology in the, that I know of, and that's who I want to work for. So a friend called me up and was like, Hey, do you know anybody that has leadership experience, possibly an economics background, and uh, uh, is really really passionate about space? I'm leaving my job at NASA headquarters, and uh, uh, trying to find somebody to replace me before I do. And I was like, uh, yeah, let me get back to you. So I hung up the phone and, uh, I was actually getting on a flight home from, from, uh, Thanksgiving, I think. And the flight took off and I was like, wait, was she talking about me? And so it, it was this <laughs> really, really silly, uh, dawning moment. And uh, one of my closest friends at the time worked uh, right next to, to her. Uh, his name's Raf Reno, and we maintain an incredible friendship to this day. But uh, so I got in, in there and still hadn't finished my degree. So I had to kind of negotiate that and say, hey, I'll finish, I'll finish this last semester. I think I'd take 18 credits to finish. Um, but I want, I really want this job. I want to work for Carissa. Um, and at NASA headquarters, utilizing my economics background, uh, doing budgetary analysis for the entire industry, much less NASA itself. So we came up with these um, these really, really amazing analyses on extended operations and and of uh, of planetary missions and things like that. Um, 
So I got to really, really nerd out and really learn a lot really quickly. And then that contract ended with the Office of Chief Financial Officer at NASA headquarters. Uh, and so I was brought back to do business development for Bryce Space and Technology with another person I was working with, Tara Holt, um, who's one of my favorite people in the space industry. Yeah, Tara's awesome. Yeah. And uh, and so we worked uh, literally back to back in this office. We were sitting back to back. Um, uh, uh, working on BD and reports for Bryce Space and Technology, and I couldn't have been happier. I was learning from uh, from a massive inspiration, um, you know, Carissa on the commercial and government uh, business development side on a daily basis. I look back at it and realize that I actually, unfortunately, did for for a while take for granted how much time she and the the uh, director of government business development at that time, Larry Helm, took to sit down and actually teach Tara and I on a daily basis. I mean, there, there were times where we were writing proposals that they didn't, they could have gone back to their offices, cranked this stuff out, had us edit or find whatever, but they would sit with us day in and day out and invest all of this time to say, to teach us how to write these proposals, how to, how to shred a document, how to actually hit all the requirements necessary. And it was just this really incredible experience that I, that I, I'm so fortunate to have had. Um, and then a buddy called me up and uh, was like, hey, we just raised a bunch of money. Um, do you have any interest in potentially working for a uh, startup, a space startup? And that buddy was John Gedmark at Astronus. They had just raised their Series A. And so I went out and interviewed with them. And, uh, and, and I loved the idea of being around hardware and working with hardware. Uh, so went out to San Francisco to work with them uh, for about two years after that. And then, you know, that's a, that's an incredible start to the, the, the to working in the industry and you've taken that business development experience and now you bring it to space flight Inc. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about that. Um, you know, and what you get to do there. Yeah. Uh, this has to be one of the most fun or the most fun I've had uh, in a, in a job from being able to speak to literally everybody in the, in the space industry, um, from, uh, from all of our incredible customers doing really, really incredible things, building the satellites that we then launch, uh, um, to the actual team at spaceflight being as, as phenomenal as it is, uh, I've honestly, um, it's one of the most supportive, uh, educational experiences I've ever, ever actually had. And, you know, our, our people really know our customers and and the focus is so much on actually serving our customers that it's really uh, inspirational day in and day out to be part of. Um, so for those of you that don't know what Spaceflight is, we are uh, one of the world's largest space um, aggregators for small satellites, uh, small satellite capacity on large and small launch vehicles. So uh, we we. Um, very much developed a concept called rideshare, where in any unused capacity on large vehicles like the Falcon 9 or uh, smaller vehicles like the Electron, um, uh, we can we can purchase the excess capacity to bring down the cost of the primary capacity for the large satellites and bring down significantly the the cost of uh, of capacity for small satellites. So it's it's kind of the difference between buying a car or uh, hailing an Uber. Um, you you pay for the trip that you need, but not the entire infrastructure to get there. And uh, so one of the things that I love most about it is that you recently had your boss on the happy hour show that you do, which wow. was absolutely hysterical. It was so brilliantly done. And uh, I will go ahead and say that there is some not safe for work language on that show, uh, you yeah. know, because this is a daytime show. But if you were an adult, please go check that out. But what I love about what you do with uh, you know the Emer Emerald City you know uh, Space Nerd Happy Hour show is that it's it it can be really fun and there can be quizzes and you have great people on like you know Tony you were talking a little bit about, about our earlier Tony Harrison who I know you guys you got you both are really close um, and there's a lot of really cool things but you also don't shy away from important topics uh, you just recently did one discussing you know, diversity and all the conversations that are going on in the space industry which is really really important um, so how do you decide how you're going to do that and I know that we're going to do one here soon and uh, we just we just keep missing each other but I'm really looking forward to coming on and, and, and doing one with you but what makes you decide where you're going to go with the topic because it's always fun and laid back, but it always ends up in a more serious place than it begins. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's true. Um, 
which is shocking given given my kind of nature <laughs> and not necessarily being uh, being the most serious person in the entire world, but liking to have fun. Uh, so Emerald City Space Nerds uh, got started uh, as kind of an offshoot of what I believe originally Emma, now Linehart, um, in Washington, D.C. started, which was the Washington, D.C. Space Nerd Happy Hour. And then Jillian uh, Pierce did a really, really phenomenal job of, of cultivating that community. And then... Nice. Uh, we love like, Jillian. We're, yeah. we're, we're fans of Jillian. I mean, she used to work for Space Foundation, so how can we not be wrong? Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then uh, Mitchell Shear took it to uh, San Francisco and started Space in the Bay, which is this huge community of all the space nerds over there. Uh, so they're essentially just happy hours for people to relax, hang out, network, but it's not a very strict networking kind of uh, kind of thing. Um, usually hosted by either companies or just at bars, uh, local scenes. So when I moved from San Francisco and working with Astronus up to work for Spaceflight in this incredible city that I've fallen in love with in Seattle, uh, I wanted to kind of carry that on. And it's a great way to meet people as well as get involved with the scene here. So started Emerald City Space Nerd Happy Hour um, with support of a lot of great friends up here. Uh, that community sort of cultivated until COVID hit. And then we didn't have anything uh, to get together or didn't have the ability to get together anymore in person. So I started uh, the show called Stir Crazy which uh, is supposed to be tongue in cheek. I love puns. So yes, it's a cocktail happy hour, <laughs> uh, but also referencing the quarantine feeling that we all have of going a little stir crazy. And I wanted just kind of a pressure release valve or uh, a time for people to actually be able to tune in and relax, but sort of half tune in and just have a good time. So we've had things from the, I hate to even say the name, but Syner Synergy Ornithocket pitch, uh, which was is my boss, uh, Grant Bonin, and, and Mike Leeling, uh, pitching this this uh, very funny concept of a of a rocket startup to uh, an investor friend. Uh, um, we've had Tanya and her best friend in the world, Cassie, on uh, to just have a you know have a fun time talking about all things space related in their careers and paths in their careers. Um, and then I was uh, really fortunate to have uh, Dr. Cyan Proctor and uh, um, Toya um, Palmer on to discuss uh, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement and everything currently going on, as well as my um, very good friend, uh, Ali Yunus, uh, and then Emily Whitman from the local uh, Seattle space community. Um, so yeah, they, they do tend to end up in a, in a more serious place um, just because it's supposed to be focused on the human side of the space industry. So even if we're goofing off uh, at any point in the conversation, it's supposed to be a place to talk about uh, being a human in the space industry. <laughs> Everybody thinks it's just these these loud personalities or, or incredible scientists or, um, or, or mathematicians or, and things like that. But we're just people that, you know, love each other and, and enjoy having a good time together and also happen to work in an industry that we love. Uh, so that's, that's where it usually takes the, takes the tilt. <laughs> Not the first person to say that, JJ. <laughs> Not the first person at all. Well, I think we, we've uh, we've laughed about it before because John and I have been in the room and walked by each other a bunch. And yeah. once we finally met, like I think it was earlier this year, yeah. everybody was like, you don't know John? And then the vice versa to mm -hmm. him. Like, How do you two not know each other? <laughs> so it's been kind of a funny thing. Uh, but I, I, love what, I love what you were saying there. Um, in, in particular, uh, I know it's been a thing that's been going around Twitter. Again, you know, I have to give a throwback to uh, a, shout, a shout out to, to Tanya. I think she's the one that started the hashtag space fam. Um, there really is room for everybody. And that's incredibly important for people to remember. Um, it's something I wish I knew a little bit sooner because the job I currently have, I could have ha I could have applied and possibly gotten that job a year earlier. Um, but I was just like, man, you know, I don't know that I really fit in the space industry yet. I don't know that my voice matters. And, um, you know, working for an incredible organization like the Space Foundation, um, it, it's been great. And it's it's always wonderful to have a passion for something and then start working for a place. And, the, and those people care about it and the people in the industry care about it. And it's it's been you know, it, it's been awesome to see that the group that the voices specifically space Twitter is really popular for that. Um, you know, you want to you want to see what's going on in the world. 
follow the people on space Twitter. You want to be completely inspired by it? Like go follow Serafina Nance, go sw- go follow Emily Calandrelli, go follow the, you know, all these amazing names that are sharing important, important things that are going on in the world, but also will be like, Oh my God, look at this picture of the moon. And you're like, Oh my God. Yes. Picture of the moon is awesome. <laughs> you're exactly right, Rose. <laughs> so, um, but I mean, I think that's one of the fun things about it is that it is such a, a wild connection um, between everybody, and it's there's something that brings it together, and it's something you know I spoke about with uh, Loretta Whitesides on our recent interview, um, and kind of talking about you know that especially specifically she talked about it in her book is that connection that space gives you to other people. And I, I, I specifically can't wait to do a, um, a micro G, I'm not a micro G flight, but a suborbital flight and be able to see the world from space. We all yeah. hear about that, the overview effect, you know, that, that the ability to see the world without borders from space. And you realize, you know, we're, we're all from this one spot and it, it's an amazing thing. So uh, yeah, the space community is definitely one that is worth, you know, reaching out to and connecting with if you haven't been already. And uh, so we're running a, a little later than we normally do just because the conversation always <laughs> flows so simply and uh and easily with us but before we uh before we wrap up can you give us a little bit of advice for people that maybe want to follow in your footsteps hear, hear what you're talking about and saying hey listen this is this is something i know i can get into it doesn't matter what the field is yeah um you you have some set of skills uh that are valuable somewhere in the space industry it's it's a lot bigger um and all the ways it needs to be for you to be a part of it um, and a lot smaller in the ways that it needs to be to be able to reach out and uh, talk to somebody about where your place is. Uh, don't be afraid to put in an application. Don't be afraid to reach out to speak to just about any of us uh, for advice on how to get involved. But do get involved, uh, you know, between SEDS, SGAC, and, and quite a few other phenomenal organizations Maybe around it. Just saying, Space Foundation, New Gen. Just want to throw that out there. Yeah, Space Federation, New Gen. Of course, um, uh, there are so many opportunities to get involved. Uh, so the more you do, and the more you people kind of can't get rid of you, <laughs> the uh, the more likely you are to find your place in space. Um, so yeah, reach out anytime and uh, and apply and get involved. And so where can people find you on the social medias? And uh, definitely don't try and find his website. Yeah. <laughs> we were talking about that later. <laughs> a little earlier. Not later. We were talking about it later because I went back in time. I have that ability. Um, uh, <laughs> 2017 or 2016 or something like that. But anyway. Um, the little face moves, though. It's like yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a little you know animation of John. And if you put your, your yeah. mouse Perfect. over it, he goes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, at Jay Conafe on Twitter is great. Awesome, John. We really appreciate you coming on today and joining us and uh, talking about all the cool things that you've done and all the outreach and the work that you've done to uh, to get more and more people to the industry. So thank you so much for joining us today. You uh, you were awesome. Cheers. Thank you so much. And everybody, that's going to wrap things up for this episode of the live version of the Space Foundation Space for You podcast. You can subscribe to this podcast. Leave us a review on Podbean, Apple Podcasts, and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And, of course, our website, www.spacefoundation.org, where you can also learn about the various ways you can support the Space Foundation. Don't forget to visit www.discoverspace.org for more digital content for teachers, parents, and students. And the uh, Discovery Center is open once again. If you are a Passport member or if you are a healthcare hero, you're a first responder, you can come in and see us today and tomorrow. Uh, So make sure that you go online and get your advanced tickets. And don't forget, face coverings are required. And if you would like to support the Space Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit, by uh, please visit us at www.spacefoundation.org backslash donate. And on all these outlets and more, it's our goal to inspire, educate, connect, and advocate for the space community. Because of the Space Foundation, we will always have space for you. And thank you for watching.